This program is the Sweetwater welcome to the Indian contingent. A warm welcome to visitors from India. Aquaponics might be humanity's most prolific and earth-friendly method of agriculture production. We're talking in terms of generation two or three. It's our intuition that India, with your organic farming centuries, that haven't been broken, like in great part they've been through our industrial agriculture. Your brilliance in the information technology revolution and the, the deep harmony of India's spiritual with India's science traditions mean that our collaborations across the oceans might win this industry a Nobel Prize for earth healing, addressing global warming, addressing water shortages, food security, cultivating self-reliant citizens, and fostering peaceful transactions across the oceans. So it is all of our great honor that you all are here. And um, this is the great farm. Uh, I'm gonna turn this part of the tour over to Jesse Blom who is the director of the Sweetwater Foundation program. Sweetwater is a hybrid enterprise. It has a commercial aspiration and legal entity called Sweetwater Organics. It was founded three years ago in hopes of establishing three fundamental purposes. The first was to experiment with upscaling commercial scale, upscaling commercial level aquaponics in a repurposed factory building in a climate like this. That's a very daunting challenge that we just tried. A second was using our knowledge and connections from this experiment to democratize and accelerate the educational diffusion of the in information and the sensibility required to create little ecosystems that produce food. And the third was to globalize the same. You all being here today, three years after the founding, is testimony to the great resources that have shown up to support us who were lacking many resources when we started. Our theory was asset-based sequential development. We didn't worry about what we didn't have, we focused on what we did have, and we took incremental steps building upon what we had and then attracting partners. We're hoping to help you all do that, and you help us do that, and we help the world do that. So this is Jesse Blom. He can provide a vastly more coherent science-based story of this great uh, miracle. Yes, sir. How do you define sweet water? Sweet water came to us from the original Americans who called the Great Lakes the sweet water seas. So it is our vision. The water, which we drink? the water that we drink right now after a lot of treatment in Milwaukee is sweet enough for me. A lot of people don't think it's sweet enough, but sweet water is an aspiration to reclaim some of our the bounty of Mother Nature. And uh, who knows how long it will take before our waters are again sweet. But there's no question that they have not been treated very well this past 200, 300 years, and it's time to awaken human species and, and take advantage of our Earth community partners, our bacteria, our plants, our trees, our fish, our animals, and our we humans. Sweet water is part of our tradition. Sweet water is part of our now, and we pray in the way that we pray and we will work for sweet water to come again. We have two different types of fish tank, this one from the original rail lane and those which were dug directly out of the foundation. This fish tank here holds um, about 7,500 gallons of water um, and so uh, 30,000 liters, let's say. And um, in this particular fish tank we have 500 tilapia fish. These are all one species of tilapia, two different color varieties. Are you all familiar with tilapia? Do you, raise, do you raise tilapia in India? No, we don't raise. India, India, there is a tilapia fish. There is? 
Yes. Uh -huh. uh, there's actually several different species of tilapia, uh -huh. but we refer to them all we as tilapia. We have a blackish kind of uh, species in India. Okay. India tilapia, they are very black colored. Okay. Fish. This particular species is uh, white Nile tilapia, uh -huh. and it's cultivated in the U.S. I think it's more um, more tolerant to cold climate. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. But it's still a tropical fish, so we're required to heat the water to about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So in this particular system, we have 507 tilapia fish. These tilapia, once they eat, they generate waste. Their waste product becomes the fertilizer for these plants. Okay. So the aquaponic system recirculates water um, so that the, the fish waste fertilizes plants, and then the plants, as they take up nutrients from the water, they then uh, filter the water for the fish. So it's a filtration process and a feeding process in which it's a symbiosis. So um, in this system that's recirculating, um, it conserves water because all the water is reused again and again and again. Unlike traditional fish farming, unlike traditional recirculating fish farming, like you saw at the Great Lakes Water Institute today at, at the UWM, yeah. they have recirculating water systems. Um, they, from time to time, in cleaning the system, they will exchange water, uh, fresh water, they, they, they uh, discharge old water and gain fresh water. In an aquaponic system, we use much less water because the water continues to circulate. It essentially cleans itself. So one fact that we say is that we can use up to 90% less water in aquaponics than we do in, in uh, conventional agricultural methods, con conventional irrigation methods. Okay, so it's a water conserving type of food production. Um, also, another way that the word sweet water comes into play is we believe that our lettuce is sweeter um, than many other uh, ways to produce lettuce. We don't believe it. It, it is. It is. It's sweeter. It's, it is. it's, it's delicious. Um, so these fish fertilize these plants here and up above and those up above and these down here. It's the equivalent of about 2,000 lettuce plants uh, that are fertilized by about 500 tilapia fish. Is there some ratio of uh, how many, what is the area of plants which is required for particular uh, aquaponics is still an experimental industry, so there are different opinions in terms of how to measure that. Uh, one very crude measurement is one tilapia fish for four, pl for four leafy green plants. So one to four is a very crude uh, ratio. Is it a flowering plant? What type of plant is it? It's a leafy green lettuce, so no flower. We harvest before uh, flower, so it's just like a leaf lettuce like you'd eat in a salad. At La Miranda you might have tasted some of our leafy greens. Is it used for salad What? What for is used? Is it vegetable and uh, the leaf is used. Leaf is used. Yeah, so we harvest the plant entirely, uh, wash and rinse, and then process the lettuce, and then replant. So, so uh, uh. all vegetables cannot uh, be grown here. Only specific vegetables which actually clarifies the water. Um, Something like that. Uh, it is uh, leafy vegetables. Yes, these are the preferred plants currently for aquaponics. Again, in, in in this experimental industry, there are people who are trying different types of plants. But currently, the most successful plants for commercial operations are leafy greens and, and basil. So usually lettuce and basil. Anything can be grown. Other vegetables also can be Anything can be grown, yes. Uh, but yes. So you're familiar with aquaponics? But you yeah. are growing yeah. only tilapia. Okay. Uh, no, we're growing yellow perch as well. So we get our yellow perch from the UWM uh, Fresh uh, Great Lakes Water Institute. The tilapia, they were originally gotten from a, a, a hatchery in New Mexico. Um, we have some yellow perch in here, not many. There are very few yellow perch left. We're waiting for a new uh, crop of perch from the university. Ideally what happens is we have um, essentially different uh, crops of fish. We, we rotate them through a cycle. So um, as soon as we harvest these, we'll replace them with another amount and therefore we have a consistent feed schedule. Um, what we've done up to this point, as we've been learning, um, we've been doing mostly a thinning method okay. within the fish out, but that creates an imbalance between our fish and our plants. Plants are growing only on water? No yes. Yeah, let me show you. Well, it's a, it's a made of tree bark. It's a reconstituted tree bark. This is the, the propagation room here. We use, we use one seed per plug, okay? and the plugs, they're manufactured for this purpose. Um, the seed is, we call it primed. It's partially germinated and then encapsulated in clay. So the germination process is frozen in time. When we receive the seed, um, we have a 90% germination rate and the seeds sprout within three to five days. So it's an it's a accelerated process of seed germination. Seed is right. available commercially? Yes, in the United States. Where do the plugs and where do the seeds come from? Uh, they come from uh, suppliers for the hydroponics industry. So I know that the plugs are manufactured in California. We also grow sprouts here. Um, 
and we can see the sprouts facility. Here we have broccoli sprouts, these are radish, and, and wheatgrass. So they only grow them to a certain stage. That's right. Keep growing them until they plant. That's right. Yeah, we harvest them at seven to ten days of age, and then they're consumed. I mean, sprouts, it's a very popular item. Um, it's a niche market in grocery stores and, and restaurants. Um, they're highly nutritious. Um, they're also expensive. So the restaurant where we had lunch today uh, gets many produce from this place uh, because they all uh, usually, so some of these things are in their menu. Um, they're sold, they're harvested just like this at a young age and packaged and consumed uh, raw like on a salad or a... For example, in India yeah. you have moong dal sprouts, yeah. very common, you don't have radish sprouts or sunflower sprouts and as commercially. Okay, it's, it's a different, different type of seed. Yeah, just yeah. moong dal, I mean lentils. Okay. Right? So the yeah. green lentils, yeah. we sprout those and we, and we do that at home. Okay. So we eat that. Yeah, I mean it's an age old tradition also in American homes, you know, to, to produce sprouts at home. But currently it's not uh, commonly practiced, so now it's a niche market, you know. Um, so you're trying to plant something other than lettuce. The These are sunflower sprouts, sprouts, radish sprouts, broccoli sprouts, peas, and uh, wheatgrass. And so, yeah, this is a separate operation entirely. Uh, these don't require any fertilization. It's just all of the uh, nutrients come from the seed. Right. And so, the water needs a met house here? Uh, the, the, we, we water with a reverse osmosis water, so it's distilled water. Oh. Yeah, the uh, sp sprouts are a very is delicate it, process. Is it rich from the bottom? This is a, core, a coconut coir base. Okay. Yeah, it's a coconut coir base. I don't know if we have an example. No, no, it's completely clean water. Yeah, the, the sprouts process is a delicate process. It requires a high levels of sanitation. And so um, before planting, we sterilize each and every surface. Um, and then the water that we use is all, uh, again, distilled reverse osmosis water. Okay. And we're working on building a facility inside of this factory um, that's going to be more secure, uh, biosecure. Um, where w then we can, you know, increase the amount of sprouts that we're growing. Because as we scale up, then our, our food safety concerns become greater. N it doesn't require it, but uh, the customers prefer a, a green, you know, and, and it on the, the, the seed only greens, or the sprout only greens with uh, light. light. Right. And it's sufficient light to green it? It's sufficient to green it, yeah. But they're harvested, I mean, all, all they need literally is a couple hours of light. Okay. Yeah, and then they'll green. What are those shapes? Light, uh, hanging, hanging uh, lights only? Yes, artificial lights. Artificial yeah. What is Wheatgrass. Wheatgrass. Wheatgrass is, is usually juiced, and people drink it as a juice. Yeah. Here we here's the kitchen. We process all of our vegetables here. So, all the vegetables are processed and delivered directly to the restaurants. Right. Very fresh produce. Uh, also grocery stores. Yeah, we serve uh, Outpost Natural Foods, Sendix, okay. and uh, Woodman's. This is the indoor farm. Uh, we've been developing it, developing it over the last three and a half years. We've made several modifications and improvements to our aquaponics technology and to our sprouts growing technology. Our biggest improvements have been in uh, filtration of the water and then in terms of fish uh, stocking density. Basically, those are our most significant improvements. Uh, actually reducing the stocking density of the fish to make for a healthier system and increasing the filtration capacity of the of the systems. So we have a healthier environment for our fish and our plants. And these have been the innovations in an industry in which, like I said, I'll say it again, it's experimental. Right? So um, there, it is a, a community of practice around the world um, in probably all the continents now. Um, people are practicing aquaponics and we all learn from one another. But there are very few, um, how do I say, formal uh, institutions that are uh, researching aquaponics. There are some, but there are very few.